I want to welcome everybody to uh, this week's data lecture. Uh, as always, I want to thank our speakers committee. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to bring in such amazing speakers and artists that talk to the data community every single Friday. Uh, this week, we are proud to have uh, Lola Aisha Agbara, who is a cultural worker and artist who was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and holds many talents under her belt. Uh, for example, design, mixed media, sculpture, photography, and installation. Uh, she says about her work, and I quote, my practice explores the multifaceted implications and ramifications of sexuality in regards to the Black experience. I work with clay as a material in order to emphasize unnecessary fragility, symbolizes an essential contradiction implicit in empowerments. Agbara, Bachelor's of Arts in Arts Entertainment and Media Management from Columbia College in Chicago in 2013, and an MFA in Visual Arts from Washington University Sam Fox School of Art and Design. In 2017, Agbara co-founded Artists in the Room, which is a collective of artists and scholars who host artists emerging and well-known in hopes of serving as a catalyst for artist development and networking. Agbara also received numerous fellowships and awards, including the Multicultural Fellowship sponsored by the NSICA 52nd Annual Conference and the Arts Public Life and Center for the Art Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture Residency at the University of Chicago. Agbara has exhibited in galleries across the country, and she is currently based in Chicago, Illinois. So if you guys would give a warm welcome to Lola Agbara. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk to you all about the work that I am doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I, of course, have prepared a presentation for this. So let's see how this goes. All right. Can we all see this? Yeah. All right. Um, hi, my name is Lola Aisha Akbara. Um, I'll be talking about my practice and process today with you all. Um, and so a quick maybe statement about the work that I'm doing. Um, I'm using the body form um, as well as the absence of the body to kind of contemplate complexities of pleasure um, as this ongoing process or due process. I work with clay, cement, metal. Uh, these materials help me play on the tensions of historical and contemporary invisibilities and hyper invisibilities. I use sculpture as a way to avoid flattening the black feminine identity as it is very intersectional and very dynamic in nature. In addition to that, uh, ceramic sculpture. I do photography, fabrication, and, and ready-made materials to support the expression of my own reality. Um, and also in the form of installations and, and standalone works of art, I usually find myself immersed in a dichotomy that explores tensions of vulnerability and, and agency in which I attend to challenge sexuality politics and racial politics and gender constructs and discourse surrounding the overall uh, discourse of feminism. Um, I'll go to the next slide. A quick breakdown of what I'll be discussing today. Um, of course, the artistic process. I'll be starting off with a perfect model and talking about my inspirations, whether they're um, maternal structures, hip hop culture or historical references. I'll be also talking about uh, my own pleasure principle to be seen and not to be seen and how that hyper visibility and invisibility informs my work. Uh, the work itself in series, uh, A Good Day to Be Black and Sexy with Labor and Love, Secretly in Witch of the Fast Hill and more photography that are more standalone works. The perfect model are these, these two images of uh, people here are my grandmothers, my paternal and maternal grandmother here. Um, in the first image you see, 
um, is my paternal grandmother, Mariamo Omotayo Aleje. And right next to that is my maternal grandmother, Lucy Mae Lewis. Uh, this is the daughter of a Nigerian immigrant and Black American born um, mother. I was equipped with a, this bilateral lens in which I viewed the world. On one hand, my African heritage taught me the value of hard work, tradition, and ancestry. And on the other hand, um, and Black American heritage taught me the value of family, perseverance. Um, however, none of these worlds actually taught me how to use one to inform the other and how to understand one, you know, how to use one to understand the other. Uh, so I do give credit to my upbringing and my experience in my research for how I'm able to assess and process my own identity as a Black femme queer artist. And so I do owe this identity for being the heart of my, my practice. Um, these women kind of taught me a lot. Um, my grandmother Lucy has taught me a, a lot. She's left a lot of gems for me. Um, both of them have transcended and I've never been able to meet my paternal grandmother. Um, however, I see much of myself in her from the stories I've been told about her. Um, my grandmother on my mother's side has left a lot of gems for me, a lot of idioms that I, I pull from and I take with me in my everyday life and I use in my practice as well. Um, one idiom that she used to say a lot um, is closed mouths don't get fed. And so speaking on behalf of what I wanted and what I needed and what was right is what I've always held close to my heart. I believe language is quintessential to understanding as understanding is quintessential to change. Um, creating and refiguring language surrounding discourse of underrepresented subject matter, such as Black feminine sexuality, I think is very vital when assessing Western fundamentals in language. And so throughout my practice, I'm using words like jouissance, which is um, essentially another word for pleasure or an intellectual pleasure. I'm using the words femme to kind of hint at a, a larger range um, and not just talking about a woman as a subject, but femininity as the subject itself. Um, and I use the word model. Um, model becomes this term of endearment within my practice. I use model to address my ceramic sculptures. And so these models capture in essence, my corporeal references to the black feminine body, thus rendering them ideal and exemplary and archetypal. Um, often time, if not most of the time, when I'm mentioning or referencing models, I'm thinking about my grandmothers, um, my ancestors, and the women in my family matriarch that influenced my life. Um, this is a collage that I've made from family photos. Uh, naturally, I use the physical aesthetic of my influencers. Um, which includes, but is not limited to maybe skin color, body types, personality, and or physical and emotional labor tied to those bodies um, that I've witnessed them do time and time again. Um, it's become an underlying theme in my work, um, the rendering of black femininity as this ideal um, and a direct refute to and othering, this othering that was created by um, racial and religious ideologies of the West um, that have been used a lot of the times to degrade black women and, and discipline white women. Uh, there's this anti-black or anti-fat or colorist um, society that kind of proves these ideologies um, right in a sense or wrong in a sense. So my practice has been heavily inspired by that and inspired by corpulence, um, particularly referencing Western culture's disdain for fat bodies. I've always been interested in the fixation with proving fat bodies to be unhealthy or inferior 
um, and disjoined as a means of prioritizing European standards of beauty. There's many layers of race and religion and class that fuel my curiosity. And so my understanding of the, the word model um, is different now. Um, before it was very, very estranged. I had a very naive idea of what the model entailed and what the model meant. And it was sold to me. It was sold to me by media, it was fashion industries. Um, all of these outlets um, kind of conditioned me to believe a true embodiment, embodiment of a model was to be maybe uh, tall or slender or wide and aesthetically pleasing, um, which is essentially a fragment of the European beauty standard that we know today. Um, so this, this mode of thinking existed throughout my adolescence and into my, my young adult years um, and it affected how I viewed myself. Um, Jumping into some of the works, fingernail fossils, uh, ghetto artifacts. Um, it's a body of work that I've been interested in and having a lot of fun with. And it's the idea um, that I'm combining two of my worlds to kind of create a transcendental moment. I mentioned my father being a Nigerian immigrant and my mother, a South Side Chicagoan. And so the woven pattern that you see references the scarification of people in Europe, uh, particularly the Ikirodu tribe in Nigeria, the tribe that my father belonged to. Uh, you'll see an image to the right of you as an example of that. Uh, the gesture itself is also taken from my mother's side, uh, using false fingernails as this marker of Black identity and beauty. I've made molds of fake fingernails um, with plaster. And I laid um, a slip, clay slip in them to kind of create this, this scarification woven pattern um, that both references as an ode to my identity and to my, my parents in a sense. Uh, so it's a glazed porcelain textile or tile, sorry. Uh, this is another work that kind of references my own identity and my childhood. Uh, Double Dutch Queen, created in 2019, is a iron casted replica of my childhood jump rope. Um, I don't know if many of you know what jump rope is. I assume you do, um, but if you don't, um, it is an era, um, a esoteric practice made popular by by black girls. And so I, I refer to it as this emblem of black adolescence. I use the metaphoric meaning of rope alongside scientific bodily references of iron to kind of reference an entanglement, a complexity and a struggle that is cons consequential to inhabiting a black pubescent femme body you'll see three barrettes um, in this piece that suggest a youthfulness. There's three, which is very symbolic for the number of players that you need to play a game of double dutch. I think this work requires its position to be placed on the floor. And so I think having an awkwardness of having an object placed on the ground ultimately disrupts the flow of leisure, disrupts the flow of walking. I experimented with this work and how it would be shown. And I often watched people stop and, and crouch down and examine the work closely. As I hope this, this placement would warrant those notions, the work became very successful as it rendered this often forgotten community very visible. Um, and it challenged the way we were implicated in, in the, in the hypervisibility or invisibility of Black youth. Most viewers may not even recognize or even understand this object. A lot of people don't know what it is when they first see it. And I, I think I like that space that 
is present, the space between object and the, and the space between viewer. It's a theme that you'll see throughout my practice. And, and so what it, this did, it, it forced people to lean in on a conversation that so desperately needed to be redirected, right? Um, to be this fast-tailed girl was to be promiscuous in some way, sexually promiscuous. And so when I speak of the fast-tailed, I'm speaking for the stereotyped or the hypersexualized Black girl um, who had an implied sexual appetite, whether sexually active or not. I'm also speaking for those who had, had to always level between freedom or being complacent in their own sexual abuse. And so my, ref my reference to rope holds a lot of significance in terms of binds and bounds that limit the body. Uh, this is another work that explores my use of rope, particularly jute rope, devouring binds that was created in 2019. Uh, this is a stoneware body with a cement coating to create texture, um, which was painted. And of course, the jute rope there to assist in the performance. But the word devour means to swallow. It means to eat up hungrily, voraciously, to consume destructively, recklessly, to engulf, to swallow up to take in greedily with the senses or intellect. In this work, devour means pretty much all of that. Um, the model that you see here is in two parts, um, standing about 42 inches high. Um, it's a mortared cement surface that I've painted this flesh fleshy brown color. And it has cavity openings um, that are painted red, kind of emulating a lipstick stained mouth or a puncture wound is would have heard in reference to that. But this model actively devours the jute rope and all of its hidden and layered and complex connotation in proximity to the body and attempts to subvert them, imposing an unspoken power dynamic. And so through the discourse surrounding Black feminine sexual identity, devouring binds is a reading of pleasure. Uh, it's a reading of agency. Um, I use a ceramic vessel as it references the body and I pull from historic associations of both mortar, the cement and the jute rope, the jute rope um, to kind of convolute its corporeal significance. I think that the jute rope in companionship to the model epitomizes bounds and labors and physical violences that are related to traumas that the black body has endured, um, sustained through, during and after transatlantic captivity. I think the use of jute rope exposes that. It's, it's very provocative. And there's a tension between domination via ownership and the black body or the flesh. And so a question I find myself asking quite a lot is how can my work disrupt ideas of the black body as a site of labor or a site of ownership and objection by using the same othering as a source of power. Uh, this is a quote from my maternal grandmother, Lucy Mae Lewis, a bird in the hand beats two in the bush. Um, she always said this to my mother and my mother had always said this to me. Um, but another idiom that translates to um, appreciating what you already have because the search of something greener may not be what it appears to be. With love and labor, this is a piece that I created during my MFA um, as a, a thesis, a part of my thesis. Um, my desire to reconstruct how performance is read aligns with my desire to subvert labor for self. I often think of Senga Nangudi's performance of objects as I'm interested in performance and 
the making of conceptual decisions that complicate how pleasure is read or isn't read in, in, in terms of art discourse or visual or the Black feminine experience. In this work, I'm using Mrs. Butterworth as a tool. Um, these glass syrup bottles hold a lot of significance as they represent the literal caricature image of the mammy. And in this work, it's a conceptual representation of Black feminine labor that was contributed to US economies. I think this is a video I'll play really quick. It's a very short um, clip of how the work is functioning in space. Um, but essentially, there's this chandelier and the utility of the chandelier in this work that bears meaning um, and contains a lot of intersections. Um, of course, the chandelier implicates the wealth in the bourgeois class lifestyle of early 18th and 19th centuries. It also references the church as a commonwealth practice and a power source of class hierarchies. Um, and the physical labor of which the decorative aesthetic entailed. It is a function, um, a functional decorative fixture that, that essentially captures light all while connecting all of these intersections um, like the corpio and labor and wealth. So taking these elements, um, whether they be from the lives of my ancestors, um, coming up as the life as Mammy, it's herself for itself, but I'm suggesting implications of Jewish science or pleasure for these figures as a vital part of processing material and subject matter. So much of the body and so much of the soul is, is given in the labor of sustaining US economies and it benefits the wealthy. An attempt to kind of overturn some of those atrocities that feed into that, um, I try to model a space where exploitations of laborers are not the primary beckoning, but rather a space for the labor to solely benefit them. I use Carol Walker um, as a reference. The demonstration of the performance becomes very symbolic um, for me. And so I'm interested in the image of Mammy because of what she represents and how it still in some ways today remains intact. I seek to imagine the possibilities of intellectual and sexual pleasure and historical context as a, re a rewritten framework to represent radical moments that serves to further new groundwork. So Kara Walker becomes my muse in that. Um, and this work, a, subtle, a Subtlety or a Marvelous Sugar Baby, um, Kara, Kara Walker uses the mammy to challenge expectancies of, of Black feminine sexuality. She collapses the mammy with a, a hypersexualization derailing from histories of asexual identities and amplifying hypersexualities. She's using this mashup of the mammy sphinx to indulge in a sexual discourse that employs labor economies of sugar, um, which furthers a complexity, I think, of when you're referencing, you know, syrup or, or maple or, you know, byproducts of sugar. Ultimately, I think she creates a new world for Mammy to exist. What I find compelling is that overlapping and the use of Mammy and byproducts of her image, uh, in addition to Walker's use of uh, byproducts, right? The metaphor of brown sugar. Um, which is an, an aphorism by Black women as they internalize their own eroticized body is explored here and in both the work of Kara Walker and I. And so I go back to this work. Uh, this is a, a sketch that I did when I was imagining this piece. I had hoped it'd be somewhat substantial in its presence it is activated by human labor. Um, 
and incorporates this element of performance that I refer to as an activation. Um, the job of the activator exists to, to service the installation. Um, essentially, they're pouring this, this syrup-like substance um, that's laced with glitter and ceramic slip and oil and smells of maple syrup into these, these open-ended glass bottles. That substance is then funneled through that bottle into these bottle pourers that lands directly into the opening uh, of the center of the, of the stump that you see here. And so it's funneled through a circulation of, of tree tapping. Um, however, in this instance, the syrup enters the tree to be tapped through the spigots on the side um, that's embedded on the sides of the tree, eventually filling these, these buckets and to be recirculated again through the chandelier. Um, I believe, I think taking the entity like, like Mrs. Butterworth's syrup bottle um, that has so much rich context of servitude and repositioning it this as a tool to be used in, in self-serving gestures, I think provides a space and opportunity for subversion of meaning to occur. Uh, Mammy's presence within my work is transformed um, and abstracted. Um, in the abstract, it translates into the types of forms I'm using, um, which could be very much uh, curvaceous, bulging, uh, corpulent forms. And could be very direct in like with this instance, the syrup bottle. I think uniting these discourses feel my, my artistic curiosity. I believe that the success lies with its ability to provide a new perspective or a new understanding in the observation of history or the observation of the objects themselves. Ain't I Pretty, I did in 2020. I'll, I'll play this video in its entirety. So using 
performance of objects as a segue into performance of self. Um, Ain't I Pretty is, is pretty much how, it's, it's about how we see ourselves, uh, particularly how we see ourselves outside of Western gazing. Um, I use my own body in this short film performance because I wanted to express something within myself, um, an idea that I, I sat with. I wanted to express that this gesture of putting on and applying lipstick or adorning the body or, or making myself more appealing or more attractive, this gesture of beauty doesn't lie with the viewer, but essentially is, is for me. I am hinting at an, an unkept beauty and how Black femmes have been conditioned to, to kind of understand themselves and their body and to have this pressure to be kept by media and, and other outlets. We aren't allowed grace to be unkept or to have messy hair or for our lipsticks to be outside the lines. And it's affected by how we see ourselves. There is an expectancy to be on at all times and it's, and it's unrealistic. The way I'm able to, to apply the lipstick outside of my lines is as a testament to that. I'm showing you with my facial gestures or the gestures of my lips and the sounds of my lip smackings um, that I am satisfied with how I am applying the lipstick, whether it be on my teeth or on my chin. Um, I'm able to reference that unkept beauty as beauty itself and make it beautiful for us in the, in the same way. Women in hip hop, whether singing or rapping have not been complicit in their own subjugation was said by Heidi R. Lewis. And this presentation will be filled with quotes, so. The Finn rapper. As an avid listener of rap and, and hip hop, female rapper in, protect, in particular, I have witnessed this empowerment through expression of explicit sexuality now more than ever. Um, this genre has informed my practice in a way that clearly recognizes and identifies my subject matter in, in context. My work is inspired by my interest of the catalogs, you know, of Lil' Kim or, or Trina, Kaya or Foxy Brown. These are artists who have paid way for, for newer musicians like Baby Mother or Meg The Stallion or Cardi B or Cupcake, which are a new group of artists or a new generation of uh, femme hip hop artists who we see now. And so these artists are engaging in discourse, not only about their bravado personas, but an amplified explicit domination, I think, in black sexual politics as a, as a whole. The exploration of, of licit and illicit um, subject matters in my work has become ground zero for not only analyzing performances of sexuality, but reading and understanding possibilities for, for pleasure to be had. And so for me, pleasure is a chance to focus on the idea of liberating intersections of gender or, or race or um, through advancement in, in feminist theory. And so a lot of the times I'm pulling from, from black feminine Black feminist theorist um, as a power source um, instead of an in, in, in incurable injury or Black feminine body as a whole. And so discourse that has been had by Black feminist theory, theorists um, 
are very underscored in my work. And so I pull from books like this, uh, Pleasure Activism, um, The Politics of Feeling Good, who, which was written by Adrian Marie Brown, or Gathered and written by, by Adrian Marie Brown. I like to think that my participation in, in fine art discourse via sexual politics is similar to how rappers or feminine rappers navigate the music industry and maybe even how, how black pornographers navigate the porn industry. I relate to the subject matter of the underrepresented because I am the underrepresented. I think society assumes and with great historic evidence, this assumption is made that situated within the sheer presence of the black feminine body comes a site of access or ownership or trauma or labor. And in fact, these assumptions become inseparable so much that it's almost impossible for society to see through an alternative lens that views these bodies without any of those attachments. Um, a lens that is able to advocate for that subject and celebrate the lives of those subjects without having been criminalized for existing. I think in my practice, I use this discourse as an entry point to, to understanding the narratives of underrepresented subject matter. So I use rap, rap lyrics to, to title some of my ceramic models. Um, one example being I Ain't Never Been a Lady, which is a, a lyrical excerpt from a rapper, Baby Mother and which you'll get to see a little later on in this. I am a clay artist. Um, this is an, a conceptual approach, I think, to, to inclusivity and autonomy, but I'll, I'll go ahead and play it first before I chat about it. Or maybe not. Hmm. There you go. And so this is a performance of the body again. Um, in this performance, I, I rub my manicured hands together with white stoneware slip in a moisturizing like manner. Um, I find myself interested in the marriage of the erotic and the mundane and the nuance and space in between. And so the erotic undertones become oddly satisfying with this merge of mundane and, and this egregious gesture. The inspiration for this came from a, a fetishized um, pornographic video that I, I saw on, on Twitter for some reason, I don't know, but um, it's a video category, I guess, that is very popular and I didn't know, but it's mon using the mundane, like using hands to kind of hint at uh, an eroticness. And I thought it was very interesting that someone would find this, you know, pleasing or sexually pleasing and alluring enough to consider it porn in some way. Um, another inspiration was my current reality or our, or our current reality, right? The constant washing of hands and having to moisturize. And on top of that idea, how important my hands become in this world of sculpture or ceramic sculpture. And so in this, I really wanted to make a statement. Um, someone like me operating under many social and economic 
intersections of identity, how I could assert myself um, in my own femininity in this world of girlhood and white cis male sculpture, right? Um, and hopefully uses to allure an audience. I think everyone could probably relate to this gesture, whether it's sexualized or not, but it's very ironic work and with a hint of comedy. <laughs> Um, black women in photography and early photography. Um, a lot of the work that I did is dependent upon a lot of theorizing and a lot of research. And as I study and conduct that research, I come across imagery like this um, that only fuels my, my, my determination and within my practice. But this is a, a examples of colonial era postcard images of African and African people and, and, and women. And, and it's really moved me for, for several reasons, but mainly because they help to reinforce and, and perpetuate an, an otherness, especially, of course, in the 19th century European stereotypes as Africa as this dark continent, right? Or devoid of any history or, or, or culture. As as the antithesis of Western cultural superiority or superiority, um, Africans were characterized in postcards as representations of savage and, and uncivilized people, the exotic other with no cultural ownership. And so this, this stereotyped visual representation of them played a critical role in how Europe was able to ration um, for a lot of things, for anti-blackness, anti-fatness, or even civilizing missions in Africa, right? And so my use of photography is an extension of my interest in depicting alternative narratives for Black and African films. It also extends my concern with corpulence and aesthetic of the grotesque. I addressed these perpetuated male gazes of the 20th century um, and modern art painters and depictions of the savage and black feminine subject. Um, painters like Picasso and Matisse and Gauguin and, and more all found themselves inspired by ethnographic black and white photographs like this that were taken by scientific photographs or photo photographers, sorry. Um, in which they exploited the, uh, the black and African feminine subject and circulated these images as, as postcards and as souvenirs. And so disrupting an, an eroticized image of bare-breasted African women that had been photographed as cultural furniture for the 20th century and modern art painters I reimagine an image that doesn't continue that, that cycle of objection, rather distorts it in a way. Uh, this is a work um, entitled, but reworked um, from 2018. Uh, the first image is an inkjet photo that was torn apart and, and rearranged. Um, the second image is a lenticular to that same image. And so with my, my photography, I, I tend to wrap or, or warp overused narratives of the savage sexuality. Um, I'm usually depicting a potential narrative that confides in the own subject's desires of viewership. And, and also physically and intellectually altering the image itself to obscure that gaze and provide that space. Um, this altering may take form in modifying the image size. It could be dis dis distancing uh, the proximity from lens to body. It could be the arrangement of which the image is to be viewed like you see here on the screen. 
Um, but my contentment with the work is determined by knowing the viewer does not have full access that they would have to visually reconstruct the image themselves, um, which then leaves the labor to be transferred from the subject to the viewer. And so by revisiting colonial African portraiture through a feminine gaze, an alternative lens, I'm able to make space for feminine perversion by presenting a narrative um, without the subjectedness or, or without further carelessness. This is an untitled work uh, from a series I've done, Classy Bougie Ratchet from last year, which are inkjet prints. Um, so this came about when um, I was navigating the world of eBay and I came across um, this lot of about 12 or 20 vintage noon magazines, but they weren't magazines I was used to seeing. They're magazines that had black women in there. And so I was, I was kind of in awe because I've never seen something in text like this. And I, and I would tell my, my friends about it. Of course, my, my feminine friends never heard of it, um, Black Tail Magazine, uh, but my more masculine friends have, they definitely were aware of the history of the magazine and pointed out how, how it, I guess it introduced them to the body or in a sense, but I, I find that interesting that none of my, my, my feminine friends have had heard about it, myself included. Um, so I started to, to play with these images um, and using them and scanning them in um, and manipulating that scanning process, um, which further obscures the image. And you kind of understand what's going on, but you don't know what's going on um, totally. So you, you have this level of access that isn't fully engaging. And I, and I, and I love that about the work in that process. And so I continue to, to act on that, providing space between the viewer and, and subject or object. Um, I've done that with this as well, the Land of the Free, um, which is on a rotating pedestal. Um, but this work is an image of one of the models that I created I started to play with um, projection. Oh, sorry. I started to play with projection, particularly the projection of images onto the models or the sculptures. And so this model rotates ever so slowly and that movement is almost unrecognizable at, at first glance. I found myself in my studio on several occasions kind of staring and mesmerized by how captivating and alluring this model had become as it relentlessly morphed, not only in its stillness, but while in motion. And so I was inclined to push that envelope further and I want it to be even more absorbed by, by its mystery. And so kind of creating an obscure image three times over um, definitely satisfied my need for that space that that version of power. Nudes is a, it's a model series, um, which is also in a continued way of exploring ambiguity and access of viewership um, by introducing an aesthetic of, of voyeurism. Um, these are Polaroid images, the mini Polaroid images of my own body um, used using my own body as, as a source of material and capturing parts of my body and very up close and obscuring that and using ambiguity as this indicator of beauty. And so this is just an extension of that. A site for sore eyes is also an extension of that just manipulating and rearranging further photos even more. 
Um, a Good Day to Be Black and Sexy um, is a series of monumental abstract figures. Um, it heightens the grotesque by indulging in these kind of racial and gender optics of beauty industries, using also the porn industry and culture and corpulence as an as a aesthetic theme. I ain't never been a lady, I think I mentioned earlier, um, stoneware and metal, we use in combining different, different materials is um, a theme that you will see throughout my practice. I wanted to create objects that oblige this dangerousness surrounding sexuality um, from a subjective point of view and kind of further extending this idea of otherness. So you'll see a lot of manipulated surfaces. Laura Aguilar would be um, an artistic reference to that with her series Grounded. And she uses this land and, and body kind of association, um, establishing a powerful voice for these, um, these invisible communities and disrupting repressive stereotypes of beauty and body representation at the same time. And so this association between land and body is what I found to be most interesting and an interesting theme in my work. Land, I think, usually references the feminine origin and context. And so I like to disrupt that by adding in these uh, manipulated surfaces, which are very rugged and very bumpy and, and scratchy even and very textured as this way to include a balance of feminine and masculine. Um, it mimics a, a gender complexity in, in, in communities usually in, in, in marginalized communities, um, having to often take the roles that aren't particularly to neither male or female on as one person. And so I speak to the grotesque and, and that aesthetic, the uh, emulation of excess flesh and untamed surfaces. And I hope that that disrupts the comfortability, the comfortability of, my, of my viewers. This is another work, All That Glitters Ain't Gold. It's another euphemism, um, but it was first used in William Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. Um, and so it means not everything is as valuable as it appears to be, but in other words, appearances can be dece deceiving. And so my rendition of this phrase is a simple paradigm of original text that has been refashioned by Black communities through African-American vernacular image. And so in this work, the metaphor stands to deceive the viewer as the model never actually confronts the viewer and is unaware of which side is front or back facing. And so this provides another side of psychological space between the viewer and the model representing a reversed hierarchy, um, a surrendering of power and agency to, to kind of be left with the model itself. And I'll end on that note. There is no justice for Black women without pleasure by Brittany Cooper.